off with some introductions here, but it should be any second now. Okay, looks like we're live. Welcome everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Jeremy Butler. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Appreciate everyone being here. This is kind of a, an interesting uh, variation of what we've been doing throughout the pandemic. Uh, we've been doing a number of these Facebook Live uh, type Q&A uh, events. This one is unique because it coincides with our first virtual fly-in um, just over a year ago. We did what we normally do, which is an in-person fly-in where we bring IAVA member veterans from around the country to Washington, D.C. with us to meet with members of Congress, uh, meet with uh, administrators from the VA, uh, Department of Defense, things like that. We had a really great uh, fly-in just over a year ago, and it was literally as people were flying home uh, that really the COVID started breaking out. Uh, you know, we were all emailing with each other, anyone getting sick, things like that. So uh, it took us a little bit to get back on track in terms of having these, uh, but this is the Thursday. We started on Monday of our first virtual fly-in. It's going really well. Uh, we've got about 11 member veterans from around the country taking part all week in uh, meetings with their members of Congress. Uh, this is one where we kind of bring you to the inside so that those of you who haven't taken part in this can sort of see how we have these conversations. Really excited to have a ranking member boss, uh, member from Illinois, uh, my home state, the great state of Illinois, uh, down southern Illinois. Uh, he's the ranking member of the House Veteran Affairs Committee, uh, which is the committee that IAVA does the most work with on the House and the Senate side. So regularly uh, meeting with uh, Representative Boss and his colleagues. Uh, but in addition to being the ranking member, uh, Congressman Boss, is, uh, he's a Marine, was a Marine, served on active duty in the 70s and 80s, uh, came back home, served as a firefighter, uh, he's a small business owner, was a state legislator for years, really just kind of exemplifies what I think a lot of us talk about when we talk about veterans, which is that they uh, maybe hang up the uniform, but they never stop serving. Uh, they just move on to serving in different ways. Uh, and so Congressman Boss, really appreciate you joining us with us today. Um, got a lot of things to talk about, everything from COVID-19 vaccines to burn pit and uh, toxic exposure legislation, support for women veterans, all sorts of things to do. Uh, but before I introduce the IAVA member veterans that are with us, want to say welcome to yourself and, and give you a second to, to well, say thank hello. you Jeremy I, and and I just enjoyed being here with you I'm looking excited I'm excited to talk with you and Corey and and Sarah you know my name is Mike Boss you already said that and I'm ranking member of the House Veterans Affairs Committee I'm a Marine veteran and a military family background my grandfather was a Marine my grandfather or my father was an Army Korean veteran I had an uncle that was Marine uh, I have a son who is, uh, for the last eight years, has been Marine Reserve Lieutenant Colonel. Um, he is, um, uh, matter of fact, here there's two members of Congress that so he actually taught them in military law school. So, uh, uh, yeah. so it, it bothered me. He, he, when he became an officer, I'm enlisted, and I had to start calling him sir. It bothered me a little bit. But the other day, he was sworn in as a judge in the state of Illinois. Now I have to call him your honor. So that's even worse. But uh, but I, but it goes further than that. Not his son, but my daughter's son um, in December graduated from Marine Corps boot camp. So, you know, this is kind of personal to me to be part of the VA committee. Uh, and, you know, and I'm grateful for your organization, uh, the AAB, the ABA, uh, for working every day and all of our uh, uh, veteran service organizations for supporting the veterans. Because if it wasn't for you, we couldn't keep informed to the level we need to. And when I'm talking about that, I'm not just talking about me as a member, but all of our members that are on the Veterans Affairs Committee. Because remember, many of them are not veterans. And, and, and though they have the passion to try to help, your input is vitally important. And, I, you know, we just got off of a hearing with a two, or, two and three quarter hour hearing with Secretary McDonald, for the first one that we had. I think that uh, though, though he and my, I might disagree on a few things, we have the same goals and issues that are out there. Uh, and we'll talk about those, you know, and that, that's, uh, so you know this, you know, it's in increasing access and accountability, giving veterans more choices and greater control, you know, creating a forever GI Bill. Now, these are all the things we've done in the past, modernizing the disability claims appeals process, which I would invite him was vitally important to me. I saw where we had to do that. You know, we've worked on pe passing veterans for uh, to try to stop veteran suicide. Uh, then 
the one thing that we is a mine is a major focus of mine, and I, I presented that whenever I actually was running to become the ranking member, which you're voted in by your colleagues, um, and that is um, our VA system has to understand that the fastest growing group of veterans is our women veterans, and we need to make sure that that the women feel comfortable going and that the services that they need are provided and provided at, at the quality level that they deserve and, and, and as all of our veterans deserve. You know, I'm a proud of our successes. Um, of course, this year, uh, we wanna work real hard to kick in on the pandemic, to get it over with. Uh, then we wanna support, uh, we want to work on toxic exposures. We're gonna talk about that, I think a little bit later. Uh, as I said, the women's issues are still out there. And then uh, this, all we want to do is make sure that when veterans leave, that the VA is available to help them to live the best life they can possibly live and provide them the services that are guaranteed to them. Uh, you know, I know that, that your organization share those priorities and, and, you know, we can achieve it as long as we keep working together uh, and we keep open conversations like this. I look forward to our time talking here together today, and uh, I'm going to throw it back to you. Let's let's get into it so everybody that's watching can, can uh, really hear about the issues. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And I, I, that's a great lead in because it, I think the Veterans uh, Affairs Committee is one of those rare spaces in Congress where there is a lot of bipartisan uh, respect. Right and working together. Uh, and we certainly saw that over the last year. I mean, the amount of legislation that was coming out of uh, the House and the VA uh, Senate, the House and Senate VA committees was just incredible. And that continues this year. And, um, and it really just continues up to this week, uh, which we'll talk about some of that uh, here in just a little bit as well. Um, but with that, I do want to turn it over because it is, you mentioned this, you know, we see as IAVA is one of our responsibilities is to communicate what our members are going through what's important to them why it's important to them and this is the one of the ways that we do that you know usually we try to do it in person uh meeting with members and their staffs to to, to pass on uh, these first person stories but hey this is turning out to work pretty well as well um so i want to introduce the two members uh two iava member veterans that we have with us today and corey i'll start off with you um i'll just give a very brief one sentence over you because i'd rather everyone hear it from you uh but corey uh, is an army veteran uh, deployed to iraq uh, among other locations as a flight medic um earned her aviation wings and air medal and really just a, an incredible story of of an amount of support uh, across the board. So Corey, uh, over to you. Love to hear a little bit about your story and what, uh, what issues are important to you and why. Thanks, Jeremy. So um, thank you uh, for, for meeting with us today and, and hearing our stories. Thank you for your service um, in the military and thank you for continuing to serve and, and helping um, our veterans um, get the care and, and the services they need. Um, so, Again, I'm an Army veteran. I spent almost eight years on active duty Army. I spent the first half of my military career at the infamous Walter Reed Army <laughs> Center where I had a, um, a, a very eye-opening, enlightening um, um, opportunity to serve our veterans that were coming straight off the battlefield. Um, and I didn't want my um, service to stop there. And so I volunteered for the Army's flight medic course and um, went to the, the flight medic course down at Fort Rucker, Alabama, and then was immediately stationed at Fort Hood. And my unit was slot to de deploy within six months of, of arriving at Fort Hood. So I did do um, one combat deployment to Iraq um, as a flight medic. And that was, um, an incredibly self-fulfilling opportunity for me. I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the people of Iraq. Um, but but during my deployment, um, I had a two-year-old um, that was emotionally taxing for, for both he and I. And at that point, um, decided that no matter how hard it was, I, I, would, I would end my military service. And as I was kind of transitioning out of the the army, that's when I learned about um, the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. And um, at that time, there was a lot of focus on transitioning service members and um, sometimes leaving the military, especially, you know, after several years when they when you kind of have what you know what you're going to wear, what um, what your hair is going to look like, how your, you know, boots are going to be shined and 
it was, it was just a little difficult to understand, okay, how, how am I supposed to dress in the professional world outside of the, the, um, uniform? Um, you know, what do I need to do to get a job? How do I, you know, market myself? And so, um, IABA really kind of hooked me up with some resources. And so I've been a member for, pro that's probably been about, um, 11 or 12 years now. And so, um, Fast forward to about three years ago was my first opportunity to do um, the the advocacy work with IBA uh, on the Hill, and um, at that time um, we were really pushing the she who bore the, born the battle um, priority, and that really resonated with me. Um, I was able to use my GI Bill and, and go back to school. Um, I got a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree with my GI Bill, but um, I actually did um, my thesis, my undergrad thesis on the healthcare of women veterans. And so when IVA did the She Who Born the Battle um, priority, that it, I was like, that was me. This is what I'm here for. This is this is what I I'm, I'm you know all about. And so I was able to come and volunteer and tell my stories about my experiences with the with the VA and. Um, how um, we do we do have a growing number of women veterans, and there are um, healthcare needs, there's social needs, um, there's other just mental health needs that are very unique to our women veterans, and we have to be sensitive um, to those needs, especially when it comes to um, the VA providing those resources. Because again, like you stated, we have a growing number of women veterans and we have to be able to serve their needs uh, just like the rest of the veterans that that we we serve in our country um and now we were able to get a lot of um the bills for those priorities passed we still have some work to do to make sure that um those provisions are upheld and that we continue to make sure that there's access um to care for for women veterans and that we're still um, providing the unique um, services that women need just in, in um, healthcare in general. Um, but the second big priority that I am really um, proud to um, advocate for is the burn pits um, and toxic exposures, because I don't think that a lot of people understand really the extent of that. They don't understand really everything that we were exposed to. Um, and, and frankly, I think a lot of the um, military members really started talking about this, really knew um, that they were exposed to things. When you went to the motor pool, you just knew that everybody started you know, their diesel vehicle up. Um, when we got to um, Bob Kalsu in Iraq, we had a burn pit still on our FOB in 2009. And we also had um, what we called the poo pond where everything was just dumped in this pond. And we flew over that pond every single time we left the wire. And, you know, the smoke from the burn pits blew almost directly into our, our um, ready room, the room that we slept in um, for, for medevac calls just, I mean, every morning it was in there. And so you just don't understand um, the extent of those. And so I, I think that, um, you know, really advocating and really telling people our stories so that we don't become like our um, previous brothers and sisters from the Vietnam era or, you know, the the blue water issues that are happening, you know, with the Marines and, and um, again, just letting people know our story so um so now i like i said before i i live in in tennessee and um i kind of bring these priorities back here to tennessee and talk to the veterans that i interact with um here i i also work for a large uh, health system here in tennessee a, a national health system and um, really try to use my experience from um, not only being a service member, but also these priorities that um, I stand for with IVA to help bring that knowledge and that education um, to the communities and the, the patients that I interact with. So. Excellent. Thank you, Corey. Appreciate it. Um, Sarah, uh, we will turn it over to you. Sarah, uh, another Army veteran, um, 
you know, we're getting a good sense of the army here. Also got the Navy on my side and Marine Corps with uh, Representative Boss. So uh, we're trying to hit the full gamut. And uh, there, there are others in the group as well that uh, aren't just from the army, but uh, got two great army stories here. Sarah was been uh, active duty and reserve 30 years, I believe. Uh, Sarah, you served all told just an incredible uh, amount of time and devotion uh, to to the military. Uh, and so with that, uh, same thing. I don't want to tell your story. We'd love to hear from you, uh, your story and what's important to you uh, for Congress to hear about. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Good. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ranking Member Bust. I just wanted to tell you, I know how hard you're working on this because I just finished watching the hearing that you were doing with uh, Secretary McDonough. So I, I know that, you know, this is something that you're doing morning, noon and night. And I just want to tell you how very, very much um, that's appreciated because as you said yourself in that hearing, um, you're the ones who hold the VA, you know, accountable. So um, we, we need you and I am so grateful that you take the time to, you know, to listen to us and to hear our stories because that's a big part of that accountability. Um, as Jeremy said, um, I went I went to the Army in the early 80s. And <laughs> I went to airborne school in 1982, um, and uh, I was active duty for many years. I will tell you that um, we have a long way to go for women, but you know we've come a long, long way. Uh, I was a, a single mother officer um, at the end of um, my. Um, eight year commitment and I was told by my boss that um, the officer corps didn't have single mothers. So my option was to get a good rating and go to the reserves or uh, get a substandard rating and stay active duty. So we've come a long, long, long way from that. And I wanna you know, give props, You know, 30 years I was in it and I've been retired since 2013. So I've been watching it still for a while. I'm very passionate about it. And I, I wanna make it clear that you know, as, as much as it seems like at times that we're kind of stuck in the midst, we are moving forward. We're moving forward and we're moving forward, um, you know, in great part due to the hard work of people like yourself. And I'm just so grateful. Um, I, like I said, I, I um, first had my first taste of the military in 1981 and I hadn't even heard of the VA um, until probably uh, maybe five years out from retirement. Um, you know, I mean, for, for me, like for me, for like uh, something that would work for me, um, something that had resources for me. So the, the outreach is a really, really big part of it. <clears throat> Once I got into the VA system, I discovered just the amazing uh, breadth of benefits that are offered. It's really the question of, you know, that transition piece is such a huge piece. We got to get people in to get them the services. Once they're in, most people really find that um, it's excellent care and it's excellent service. The things that appealed to me about the IAVA um, and the reason why I um, uh, advocate for this particular VSO are they just aligned, the, the things that they were important to them were aligned with the things that were important to me. Um, I am someone who has spent time in a VA mental health inpatient uh, ward twice. Um, the first time I had to wait for almost three days in an ER because they did not have a bed for a woman veteran anywhere in Southern California. Southern California has like 25 million people. There was no bed for a woman veteran and uh, there were no showers in the ER. There was no toothbrush in the ER. So it was, you know, it was an experience that I don't think any veteran should have to go through. And the only reason why I went through it was because I was a woman. Um, I'll also say that I am amazed and um, incredibly grateful for some of the beautiful new VA medical facilities and the hard work they're doing on research. Um, I happen to live between the LA and San Diego regions. And so I'm kind of lucky I get to choose where I go when I go to San Diego. I drive about 40 miles to their beautiful Oceanside facility um, where I can have a well woman exam done, but there's no mammogram. I have to drive another 35 miles if I wanna have a mammogram within the system. And <clears throat> I can, um, again, another wonderful benefit is VA Choice. And I, and I, um, I uh, am a member of VA Choice, meaning that the VA will pay for right. me to essentially use TRICARE services. The problem is because the two don't talk, if I did that mammogram 10 miles from my house using VA Choice, 
I would have to get the digital copy of the record and hand carry it to the VA to get it into my VA record. So, you know, the VA, I think, just needs to be more cognizant of the fact that, you know, with more and more women um, service members and more and more women veterans, there really shouldn't be a radiology clinic that doesn't have the ability to do a mammogram or for pregnant service members, a sonogram. Um, so I think that, you know, the IAVA's um, focus on women's issue is a big draw for me. And I'm really grateful that that's an issue for you too. It, it makes me, makes my heart go pitter patter when people say, yes, this is something we need to look at. Um, I know that uh, uh, like Corey, um, well, I got, I got my first set of deployment orders on uh, Christmas Eve, 2001. I was in the reserves at the time and my youngest child was 18 months old. And eight days later, I was in uniform and um, on my way to some, you know, uh, brief training and then overseas. And <clears throat> after that deployment in 2002, I did multiple more deployments. And there was never a point in time, um, you know, when you were actually in a combat zone where there wasn't a burn pit. But I, I think that the, 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 um, focus on burn pits is, is well-deserved, but it's just toxic exposures. We didn't have a choice about what water we drank. Water was delivered in bottles on pallets and you could drive around your little fob or your cop and you could see a yard full of those palleted things of water bottles that would just sit there for months in 125 degree heat with the bottles degrading. Uh, we read multiple articles about how the water wasn't even filtered. And that was the water we was used for our cooking as well. So um, when I came back, I happened to have a holistic civilian doctor who wanted to do a lot of testing and she found cesium and strontium and all kinds of heavy metals in my blood. Um, and you know, those are things that are just floating in the air. Um, so I think that the, the overall concept of, of toxic exposures is it's a broad subject. It's something that I'm so appreciative that uh, people are looking at and especially that you're looking at. And I think that all of these, um, these opportunities for veterans to get in front of both you know, policymakers and legislature, legislators and you know, Secretary McDonough just do uh, our, warm my heart and make me feel like you know, we're all pulling on for the same thing. And so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. I will say that um, just very briefly on the issue of toxic exposures, I don't want anybody for, to forget, we hear a lot about asthma, we hear a lot about cancer and respiratory issues. My issues are primarily autoimmune conditions. I had never heard of an autoimmune condition, but when I came back from my third deployment, um, I was just in absolutely agonizing pain all the time, coughing, my respiratory system didn't work. Um, I, my civilian doctor uh, diagnosed me with fibromyalgia, which I'd never heard of before. Uh, the VA uh, did several, several exams of me and would not diagnose me with fibromyalgia. I've subsequently been um, told by my civilian doctors that I have indicators of lupus and now I'm losing feeling in both my hands and I'm starting to fall and they think I may have MS. Um, but again, it's very hard to get the VA to step up and say, yes, these autoimmune things are connected to that service. So again, I'm so grateful. Jeremy, thank you so much, so much for this opportunity. Everybody at IAVA, I just am so proud of you guys and I'm so grateful for all the opportunities you've given us. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank awesome. You. Thank you, Sarah. That, that was outstanding. You touched on a lot of good points, both of you did, uh, especially the burn pits. It's not just burn pits, it's toxic exposure. Toxic a lot of times exposure. I yeah, catch myself. You want to myself. make sure that we say that that's what it is. Yeah. Exactly. And I catch myself a lot of times, you know, I, and then I try and say, you know, burn pits is shorthand for all the toxic exposures. Exactly. Um, exactly. But we really should be talking about toxic exposures. It's just that we kind of started this whole campaign around burn pits because that's what got people's attention, I think. But now we really need to do it. The, the good news is, and Rang Member Boss, I want to throw it back your way because you happen to just introduce some legislation. So we'd love to hear from you about what you and your colleagues uh, just did this earlier this week. Well, we, we actually introduced the uh, Toxic Exposure in America uh, Military Act, which is acronym TEAM uh, Act. And it is, it is just that. Look, whether it is uh, Blue Water Navy, Agent Orange, all of these over the years, 
what we've done is we've made the mistake, VA and the American, uh, our, our military has said, oh, no, 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 until two thirds of our veterans have died off and then the cost is down a little bit. And then all of a sudden they say, oh yeah, I guess it's real. We can't do that again. We can't do that again. And that's what this bill is trying to do. Yeah, we introduced it yesterday. Uh, it allows veterans to, who experience toxic exposure to enroll in the VA care. Uh, it develops a consistent process for VA to establish a uh, presumption of service connections for toxic exposure, and then advance research regarding toxic exposure, and then require training on toxic exposure for VA staff so they can identify and go, yeah, that's it, okay? And, and, and it is supported by more than 30 uh, VSO and military organizations, uh, you know, so we're going to be pushing for that because of what I just said. We and, and we've got to do that. We can't. We've got to learn from one thing from our past. Okay. And 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 there has never been a war fighter in our nation's history that hasn't walked into some type of toxic exposure. In the First World War, you knew what it was. It was mustard gas. Well, then the rules of rules of war came up, which has always kind of got me. Uh, but uh, and oh, we can't use that anymore. Well, really? Then you had then you had radiation exposure and, and, and all the other things that were exposed during the Second World War. And then we had Agent Orange, which we did to ourselves. You know, it, those people who were in Vietnam understood why we did it. You know, that foliage was, if you could knock that down, you could see the enemy. Uh, but they were exposed to it, but it took so long. Same thing here. You know, you, you, when you're assigned a military position to do something, you don't say, hey, I'm not sure I want to go over there. There's there's that pit burning over there. I, I'd rather not get near that. No, you get assigned your duty and you go do your job because that's what you're told to do. Uh, it, that, that immediate obedience to order thing is uh, is will sometimes get you in those types of situations. But we have responsibility. The responsibility is to make sure that if you were exposed to that and you have medical conditions that show that, then it's our responsibility to cover those medical conditions and also be aware of what those are. So, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's been too long coming, but try to explain to people uh, that, that, and trying to find the science with it as well. But we've got, to, one, one advantage we are going to have, and, and, and I believe as it goes on, as we've started making sure that your record, your medical records, as well as your military records are kept whole, from the day you take and lift your hand until the day you breathe your last breath, going through VA and everything like that, so that all of a sudden we can say, if you all of a sudden start getting symptoms, we're going to be able to look back and go, hey, you know, you were in this country at this time, and let me give you a list of all of your fellow veterans that are that they're not experiencing this. See, it, this is a stuff that we should be able to use the modern technology to aggressively go after this and make sure we're taking care of our veterans from day one. Absolutely. Well put. And it, you, you touched on a few things I want to talk about a little bit more. Um, you know, one of them is, is, as you said, this is something we did to ourselves, especially when we're talking about the burn pits, but that expands onto other toxins that we talk about. One that's, you know, big in the Navy that we talk about, but it's certainly in others, is the PFAS, and that's an acronym for some long chemical agent, but uh, it's found in firefighting foam, uh, yep. so it gets on you. Uh, it also, on a various basis throughout the country, even here domestically, you know, it leaks into the soil, gets into the drinking water. Again, going back to Sarah's point about toxin uh, in, in drinking water and things like that. So there's a lot of these issues that- uh, this, another, another, issue on PFAS, another issue on PFAS that you need to know is the, the uh, chairman uh, of the, the DAMA committee, uh, Loria, as you know, she was a captain of a major, major, major naval vessel. She said that that's what they used when offshore to clean the ships with because they had it readily available. So exactly. all of the people that were using it were just, when, when she started hearing about it, she said, that's what we clean the ship because it was there and available. Exactly. So, and, and now we know how, how much exposure there is to that. It's not just firefighters it, that, that were exposed. It, it was a whole lot of people in our military presence. And well, we, gotta, we gotta be able to identify it. On big installations, um, at, for one of my deployments, I was at Taji in Iraq in 2008, and that's when 
um, pre-1991 Saddam Hussein chemical weapons were unearthed and our decision somehow was to burn them. Um, you know, and so you had 40,000 people, you know, in the Taji area that were exposed to that. I, my eldest son was also uh, deployed to Syria. And, you know, Syria is a place that regularly uses gas. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we need to assume that our troops as well have been exposed to that. So I think it's just a very, very broad topic. And it, and it makes me um, makes me very grateful to know that everybody's looking at it from with a really broad lens. It kind of made me sad, uh, 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 Member Bost, when you were saying it started with mustard gas, it sort of seems to be ending with sarin gas. And, you know, you know, but we do need to, we just need to get it right. We just need you know, to get it right because the, 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 the people who reality, did the job were, were didn't choose to be exposed to any of that. Right. The sad reality is, is that remember, the Geneva Convention are for those countries that are wanting to follow it, and not all of them follow it. And but but that doesn't mean that isn't the that isn't where we okay, well, they don't follow the Geneva Convention, so we're not gonna send the war fighters there. No, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so you also touched on another point that I'll just touch on briefly, and then I got another question for you. Um, talked about, you know, being able to track this from active duty into veteran status, and this gets to something that some people are tracking, which is the Electronic Health Record Modern yes. Modernization Act, EHRM. Yep. Um, VA just came out and said that they're going to be doing a deep dive on this program. Basically, and I'm, forgive me if I get the numbers wrong, but we're talking a $10 billion investment in the correct. VA to upgrade their systems so that your health records can transfer seamlessly from your active duty time to your time as a veteran. And for those that don't know, that, it's that a is complete correct. disconnect. Uh, that right is now, but, and, and let me tell you right now, we're in the process of turning it up in the Washington, in, in uh, Washington state. That being said, it's not going too well. And, and so I think that the secretary did a wise thing. We thought he was gonna, we were asking for us about a six month break. He's taken a three month to try to figure out where we're at. So we don't push it on out and make a lot of mistakes. Let's get it right. And then let's run it out. So it, it will take a couple, it, it's gonna take several years to get the whole process turned up worldwide. Now understand that what I just said, worldwide, not nationwide, any place there's a veterans facility, and they'll communicate with each other. And, and let me also say this, that isn't the only place where we need to improve IT. We are needing to improve IT for everything, for, for our claims, uh, for, for uh, when we're working on already for the, the, uh, uh, the new GI Bill to make sure when our veterans apply and do that, that it is all, all tied together. So we know everything about that veteran to help them like I said, until their very last breath, and even that to make sure that they get placed if they if they choose to go to a VA burial site, we will make sure we do that too. Well, um, it, it, it's it's things that have to be invested in, but it's a good investment. I just this week I I went to a funeral of an uncle of mine who was Air Force, uh, and and they called and they're having trouble getting his records. Thank heaven they were able to find his DD-214 so he can have his benefits at his funeral. But many of them are not getting those right now. And I never thought about the fact, I didn't tell my wife where mine is. I know exactly where it is. However, then she's gonna to have to go find a microfish reader to read it, but that's a whole. <laughs> that, yeah, and that's so, right. so turning this up is, is vitally important. And another job of our committee is making sure that not only is it, we passed the law, but when you, it, unlike Frag, unlike Fraggle Rock, it, it isn't just Bill on the Hill and then you're done. It's passing the bill on the Hill, yes, but then it's making sure that the bill is properly implemented in whichever agency, in this case the VA, exactly as it was supposed to be when you passed. So that's exactly that, that's the oversight. No, that's exactly right, uh, and we appreciate your focus on that. Um, so I wanted to ask because I didn't get to see uh, today's hearing because I was in some other meetings, uh, but with uh, Secretary McDonough's uh, first appearance, was it, I guess it was his first yeah, appearance. Yeah, that was his first appearance. Yeah, so I'd love to hear how it goes. I know Sarah was watching. I don't know if Corey was able to watch, but I missed it. would love to hear how your thoughts on, on how it went. It, it, it went well. Um, you know, he and I had a chance to walk outside here at the Capitol. We didn't meet in a room so we could actually talk. 
you know, and, and didn't do it virtual. Uh, and and, and um, he, he has the same focus I do on a lot of stuff. We're, we're kind of in disagreement right now on, on certain things. I, I want a lot of, he, he doesn't disagree that we need to have oversight. I think we put too much money on the COVID veteran side in the last bill because we hadn't spent $10 billion of the money from the CARES Act. And now they put 17 billion more that the VA told us we probably didn't need. But, you know, I mean, so it, these are little things like that. But as far as the overall, look, it is just as we said off the start, it's bipartisan. Taking care of our veterans is not something that we're gonna say, oh, well, Republicans feel this way and Democrats feel this way. No, it is taking care of our veterans. But it also can include spending our dollars wisely so we can take care of them better. better. And so, uh, but, but the hearing itself went very well. A lot of good questions asked and a wide range of stuff. I wanted to say, sir, that um, I don't often sit and watch um, congressional hearings <laughs> from beginning to end. It's not uh, a she con. has a real life, right? It <laughs> well, actually, actually, believe it or not, um, you know, my 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 mental health um, and and PTS really kind of have limited me. But because of the VA, because of the treatment I've gotten, um, I was able to buy a farm, and I basically, you know, I live a normal life. I don't go out a lot. I, I'm not um, I'm not always okay with that, but I I live happily with on, in a wonderful place, and I, you know, I. I raise puppies, uh, so I, you know, my life is mostly really, really good, and and I credit the VA with that. And I wanted to tell you that, as somebody who, like I said, does not spend a lot of time sitting through congressional hearings, it in this world of polarization, it was so wonderful to sit and listen to voice after voice after voice, and everybody was really, um, almost all in. Um, positive and helpful mode and it just seemed like everybody was all on one side and that felt so good because you know you don't get a lot of that these days and it was it for for me sitting through my first full congressional hearing um i found it a really great experience and i i was i was so pleased and grateful that this is all all this bipartisanship is about veterans because we can all agree that that's something that's important and we should all take care of Sarah, Sarah, thanks for saying that. And just for everybody that's watching, know this, that unfortunately we do live in that polarized world, but let me tell you that there's a lot more bipartisanship that goes on that people don't know about. And the reason you don't know about it, because unless you sit and watch what goes on, what you end up hearing is you either get uh, social media on one side or the other, or a 24 hour news network that's selling a product, okay? And, and, and you've got to understand that uh, I have good friends on both sides of the aisle. Um, and, and we, especially with issues as far as veterans are concerned, roads, bridges, and highways, that falls under that too, okay? They're, they're, they say that uh, there's no Democrat pothole or Republican pothole, there's just potholes that need to be fixed. Um, but, you know, other issues cause partisanship. Here, veterans shouldn't be. And, and we, we're, I'm glad you watched it. I really am. And I'll say it was also really fascinating to watch the sausage being made. And to anybody who's watching this Facebook Live who hasn't done that, it was an extremely educational experience for me. And, and it was a very positive experience because like you said, it isn't all partisanship. It isn't all people disagree. 99% of it is everybody getting along and the rest is the details. And it was very heartening for me to see that. And I'm grateful to the IABA for making me an advocate and pulling in, pulling me into, I would never have done this otherwise. So it's, I really sort of credit the IABA with, um, you know, uh, pushing me to be an advocate and, and learning more about government and seeing, hey, good government, is good business and good business well, you know, is you know un, un, you know there is good government out there everybody automatically says there's no such thing as good government of course they also say there's never not not such, any such thing as a military intelligence too but that's you know <laughs> Did I, did I mention what I did for 30 years? I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> there is an intelligence officer, so, uh, but that's all right. You know, we all make fun of ourselves in the military. Um, no, that's a great point. And so I want to.
I want to touch on something else because, again, going back to this whole part about the bipartisanship and what we've seen, uh, talking about additional legislation that just passed, uh, another bill that you were a part of, sir, was the, the Save Lives Act and the expansion of uh, vaccines, vaccinations. Yeah. Uh, so you so what we a little bit about that. Yeah. What, what, so what we discovered, and we we actually, the partisanship, so I'll explain that too. Uh, we had 13 amendments that we wanted to put on. Understand the last uh, uh, bill that the, the president pushed forward for COVID, uh, there was no Republican input. But we did have 13 amendments that we tried to put in because of partisan reasons, none of them were accepted. However, Chairman Takano knew whenever I tried to carry uh, the one regarding the vaccine uh, that actually provided vaccine for all veterans, not just those that qualify under VA services, but not only for veterans, but for veterans caregivers as well. So that we can get them vaccinated as quick as possible. When the chairman actually said, we're not gonna accept that with this bill, he made a promise to me that day that we were gonna come back and work on it. We did and just a week or two later. That, was, that bill was signed into law yesterday morning by the president. And it does just that, it provides the veterans that are any veteran can go to the VA. We've got to get the word out there so that they'll go to the VAs, get signed up, get their vaccination. We can get this put out. We got commitment uh, this morning or in the, in the hearing earlier uh, that that uh, the secretary believes it's no problem. They're going to be able to do it. Uh, the only problem that could occur is all of a sudden they start doing so many that they start running low on vaccines. They don't see that right now, but but they're making sure they try to take care of that. So it is law as of today. So if you are out there and you are not vaccinated, uh, probably most people on this call are, are qualified for the services anyway, but get to your local VA if you can uh, and make, make sure that you're vaccinated. And if you are in a situation where you have a caregiver or your spouse is your caregiver, they are also gonna be vaccinated. So get them on. Yeah, it's outstanding. Uh, really just impressive how quickly that passed. And well, I, I should have been saying this from the beginning, but we'll be dropping links into the Facebook yeah. stream on this <laughs> to include about this, uh, about how the folks can uh, reach out. I actually just did it myself this morning. Um, you know, like you said, many people on here are probably veterans and know, but many civilians don't know that just because you're a veteran doesn't mean you qualify for you know, and things qualify. like that. Right. Um, but with this, uh, any veteran uh, is, is able to get a vaccine, spouses of veterans. Um, and so I used the link this morning, uh, went in and basically put my name on a, on a list so that they'll, uh, the, um, for me, the Manhattan VA will reach out to me when I can uh, get a vaccine. So yes. we'll drop that link in this. And it really is the fast, incredible. The faster we get people vaccinated, the better we are. Exactly. So we're moving in that direction. Uh, of course, the Marine Corps taught me not like needles too much. So I'm hoping for the Johnson Johnson, by the way, that's only one chance. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I, I keep hearing about how, you know, we, we know that on the active duty side, it's still voluntary. Uh, and it's all the, the young soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and uh, that aren't getting it. Uh, so we need we need everyone to tell them that they need to get that, it. That's because, that, because that's because we're all 10 foot tall and bulletproof at that age. Exactly. That is exactly <laughs> right. Uh, and Corey knows that coming from her medical background and everything. Corey, you've been very patiently and quietly uh, <laughs> following been, along with this. We'd love to hear from you. You use your GI Bill for both undergrad and grad school. Uh, me personally, I, I have access to the GI Bill. I literally tried to use it uh, back in previous jobs. Uh, this was before I was with IAVA and literally gave up because it's like, too much of a pain in the ass. I ended up, uh, I'm still in the reserves. I got my master's degree through the reserves for free, which was great. Uh, but how did it go for you? And what do you see is what, what needs to be done to, to make the GI Bill better and more accessible. I'm gonna be honest with you, Jeremy. I had the complete opposite experience. It was um, it was easy for me. I um, I loved it. I actually um, converted um, to the post 9/11 GI Bill. I I was still in a time where you could use the Montgomery GI Bill or the post 9/11 GI Bill, and I I did opt to um, switch over. I also um, took advantage of uh, tuition assistance when the military was still paying 100% tuition assistance to its active duty service members. So I actually got an associate's degree while I was on active duty. And so when I departed the military, I didn't have um, a whole lot left to get my bachelor's degree and then had enough left over to get my master's degree. Um, it, it actually... Um, 
the reason I guess I had a great experience with it is because um, um, my husband was still active duty military. So we were moving around all the time. And uh, again, I was fortunately in an era where um, online classes were really starting to come about and people were becoming more comfortable with online schooling. Um, and I enrolled in a school um, in here in Tennessee, Middle Tennessee State University, that was kind of one of the first to have a bachelor's degree program that you could pretty much do fully online. And they were very supportive um, when I had to actually go in and take tests to let me go to a local um, community college or a local college and have my test proctored. And so that made it really easy for me to be able to take any test in person that I had to. Um, and, and that allowed me to travel with my husband and not have to worry about changing schools and getting transcripts all over again. And some of my credits not transferring over. Um, MTSU also was very vet veteran friendly and they actually accepted a lot of my um, credits uh, from my military training to, to my degree. So, so I had a fabulous experience on top of that. I was, um, able to, to work, but also draw, um, BAH housing allowance from my GI bill, which was, was helpful because at the time, um, before, before, um, before my husband and I got married, you know, being a single mom and leaving the military, um, a lot of people really think that um, it is is super easy to find a job when you leave the military, but um, it it isn't. And um, I I was really down to the wire when it came to finding him uh, after I left active service because um, what I did in the military from a medical standpoint, I had no civilian licensure for, so I could not work in the civilian sector. I, I had an EMT, but if I would have taken an EMT job from my military service to that, I would have taken a drastic pay cut, probably to the point where I couldn't have supported my son by myself. And so um, the, the BAH was very helpful as I was um, going to school full time and, and also trying to find employment. So um, I, I am grateful for for the GI Bill. I definitely think it's it's an earned entitlement. I, I did pay into it my first year, but I don't think that that is um, something that veterans should take for granted if they have the opportunity to use it. I have no student loans. I think a lot of people in my profession and my generation and that have the degrees that I have probably can't say the same, um, especially in the civilian sector. So I, I, I definitely am grateful to it. I think it's a um, awesome benefit for your service. So, um, so I'm sorry, it, experience, it, Jeremy. <laughs> it, it, especially, especially the new GI Bill. Yeah. And, and, and the new GI Bill, and, and let me tell you how lucky I was. You know, the, the GI Bill of the Vietnam War expired in 1978. Of course, I went in the Marine Corps in 1979, and then there was no GI Bill, and it came out in 84. I got out in 82. So um, I'm one of the lucky ones. That, um, however, I was from Illinois, and for those of your listeners that are from Illinois, this is still available to you. Uh, if you are a veteran who leaves from Illinois to do your time of service and you come back to Illinois, for years they've had the waiver, which basically you can go into any state school or state uh, uh, community college and receive a total waiver of tuitions, that's not fees, but tuition uh, for a full four-year degree. So. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I remember hearing that. Uh, and even though I'm from Illinois, I made the mistake of I didn't join from Illinois. From Illinois. So I missed yeah. out on that one, unfortunately. <laughs> but Corey, I'm glad you had a good GI Bill experience. That's fantastic. Really, in the end, it was really my own fault of just not putting enough time to figure it out. But I'm glad we touched on that because what it does want to highlight is that everything that we do is about trying to make the VA more and more supportive for veterans. You know, a lot of people think we're just bashing on the VA, but the reality is they do an incredible amount of work for veterans. And we just want to make sure that it is uh, as and, seamless and flawless for the veterans. And Jerry, Jeremy, the, the, the thing that is vitally important to know that we're trying to convince the VA of, uh, and that's what we're doing with the IT for that as well. If your first experience with the VA is you get out and it's about the GI Bill and you don't right from then on, Think, oh, it's just a VA. They can't do anything for me. We don't want that. 
we want to provide a great service there. And all of a sudden, then you'll come back and go, you know what, they took care of that. They did a great job here. That means they're probably gonna do a good job there. We, we, we try to explain that to them, how important. Exactly, no, and that's the key. Um, I know we've got some questions online. Victor, why don't I throw it over to you for a question from the audience as we got about 10 minutes left. Sure, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, this, this first question is for ranking member Vost. Uh, why is supporting women veterans a priority for you in particular? Well, let me tell you because I know what they face. Of course, let me also explain this. I said that we're a military family. None of my daughters or granddaughters have entered, but if they do, why wouldn't they receive benefits that are appropriate for their service and not, not receive quality benefits? And let me tell you, I have two daughters and I have seven granddaughters. I have 11 grandchildren, but I have seven granddaughters. I want to know, because it's highly possible that one of them, if two of them or three of them, the way things are going, will at some time serve. And I want to know that when they go, they lead their time of active service, that when they go to the VA, one, they don't feel intimidated by going there, two, that they won't be sexually harassed while they're there, and, and there won't be any of that going on, which is one thing, some of the things we're working on as well, but also to know that the services that they're gonna receive there, they don't have to feel like, oh, that's, that's only a woman's issue, why would I go to the VA for that? No, you go to there because that's the medical issues that are gonna be provided for you. Uh, and that's why it is, and, and it is a case where, you know, whenever I first went into the military, as, as Sarah said, you know, it, it was it was a different time in the military, and and it didn't matter uh, whether it was your your spouse or you were a woman veteran. They kind of just had the attitude that you know it, they they didn't issue it. it it's not there, um, or you know. If you're just a military person and your needs aren't any different than anybody else's. And that's what we've got to get away from and, and be more, uh, look, we've got to live in the world we live in and you've got to understand the medical care that it needs to be set up so it can handle the different genders. And, and, and so everybody feels welcome there. Absolutely. Thank you. Victor, do you have another question? Thank you so much for that, sir. Uh, the next question is for both Sarah and Corey. Uh, you are both absolutely inspiring. What would you each, what would each of you say to young women that are thinking about joining the military? Corey, do you want to go first? Looks like you. Um, I'd say do it. Go for it. Absolutely. Um, you know, I I think you know. Back, you know, when you served ranking member Boston, when Sarah served, it was a different time. It was a different world we lived in. And, and hopefully we've learned from that and we've evolved. And I think um, women understand that we're, we're just in that we are a member of society. We, we can we can do whatever we put our minds to. Nothing, you know, being a woman should, should hold you back. And if, if that's what you want to do, I will tell you that um, looking not even looking back, even during my time in the military, it, it was probably the most self-fulfilling job I, I had. Um, and, um, you know, I love to serve people. The reason I went, I was, I was actually, um, in high school when, when, um, 9-11 hit in New York City when the when the towers came down and from that time I just remember I, I want to do something to help I want to do something to help and so I actually joined um, two years after September 11th and um, just I, I wanted to help I wanted to be a part of the solution and and so I think to to any young girl who who wants to be, you know be a soldier I, I say do it when I was in basic training I used to make my drill sergeants laugh because they would be like what do you want to be and I was like I'm going to be the first female airborne ranger um, you know and at the time it was a joke like really because I, the girls were not going to do that um, but today they are and I you know I think that I'm getting a little emotional about it but I think it's it's awesome like if that's what um, they want to do if that's their dream, go for it. Um, it's an experience that you can't get doing anything else. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for the relationships that I built um, in the military. It pulled me out of, um, you know, small town Tennessee and showed me that there's an entire world out there. There's um, cultures that are fascinating. And so um, 
don't don't hold yourself back just because you think you're you're a girl so um well i guess you know my experience again is one of change um just a crazy drastic change and and all for the good so i would just say that I've, I've had people ask me you know why did you stay in so long i mean if you look back on the 30 years i was in there were an awful lot of scandals um a tail hook uh for one which younger people may not even have heard of but um but the thing is that you know if somebody doesn't stay and keep working then change never happens and so from my perspective even though you know, my career didn't progress the way my male peers' uh, careers progressed. Um, time I took off uh, to be in the inactive reserves and, and take care of my children um, actually, you know, hurt my career. Um, but the thing is that I, I just feel like you, if you're not going to stick with it, then change isn't going to happen. And it's it's people who've 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 seen those changes who can carry the banner to say listen you know per persistence works and and staying in the room and being the competent person speaking you know at first you walk in and everybody's like she's the woman after a while it's you just walk in and it's like she's the person with the answers and i found it when i was in iraq it was kind of fascinating i had a sort of unique position as um i don't know what i'm an easy way to call it, maybe cultural advisor. And um, my boss kept on getting invited to a lot of Iraqi functions, um, but the invitation always went around, always went along with this little corollary, oh, you have to bring Colonel, Colonel Letts with you. And it was, it was kind of, I said, well, they, they just want to see the two headed snake, you know, a, a high rank, higher ranking woman in, in uniform was not something you could see in Iraq. And and uh, but I and and some people are like, well, why do you let yourself get used like that? And I said, you know, I don't see it as that. I see it as an opportunity to walk into the room and show people that you know, actually, the woman has some great ideas and is willing to work hard and be a team member. And so I really just think it's a matter of being persistent and um, finding the helpers. And and ranking member Bost, you're obviously a helper. Jeremy and IEVA, you know, huge helpers. And we wouldn't be where we are now. We wouldn't have women four-star generals. I'm just so excited to see women four-star generals. We wouldn't have that if there hadn't been women who were willing to, you know, frankly, take it on the chin and keep on slogging, keep on going, keep on going. And so, you know, I won't say it was all fun. There were uh, definitely some rough patches, but like Corey said, what kept me in the military it was partially the mission, but it was really the people. You just fall in love with the people. You fall in love with the other people who are there, who feel committed to service, who will do anything for their battle buddy. And, and then you just get addicted to the people and you get, you get addicted to that, um, that sense of community and caring. And I think that what we're all trying to do, which is to make a sense, a, commu a, a community of caring for people leaving the military to fall into so that they don't lose that because that's why they stay in and then it's over. Where do they go? Well, the VA can be that caring community that can catch them because we know how to do it. We were all there, been there, done that, right? So again, I just think it's about persistence and sticking with it and keep on, you know, just calmly and softly speaking the good word. And, you know, eventually people learn. I don't think that there's anybody in US government now who wouldn't say that women have been an asset to the military. And I'm proud, I agree. Very, proud I agree. very proud to have, to have been um, part of that process. Thank you both. Outstanding answers. Well, we're coming up on the hour. Uh, Corey, Corey and Sarah, thank you both so much. Um, I want to, uh, I should have said this also from the beginning, Corey and Sarah, part of our all-star advocacy week uh, that IAVA has been doing. Uh, please follow along on Twitter and social. We've been using the hashtag all-star advocacy to see all the other meetings uh, that Corey, Sarah, and all of our other uh, IAVA members have been taking part in. Uh, if you need support in any way, reach out to us at quickreactionforce.org. Uh, that's IAVA's 24 seven uh, available hotline. Uh, you can call go online, you can get a phone number. You can reach out just online 
for really support and anything that you might need. Uh, we've got people standing by 24 seven veterans to, to, to connect with you and to help you get connected to resources that you need. Um, Stay tuned because toxic exposure is uh, the issue of, I think, this year and the uh, 117th Congress. Um, Ranking member boss, thank you. Uh, thank for thank you, Corey. Thank doing. you, Jeremy. And, and Corey and, and, and Sarah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your service and, and thank you for what you're doing for our veterans now and keeping us informed. I, I just can't say thank you enough. Outstanding. No, we appreciate it. And really do we look forward to continuing to work with you this year. I think we're really going to get it done on the toxic exposure legislation and, and we need your leadership to make that happen. So thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Corey and Sarah. Uh, and thank you everyone for watching. Uh, appreciate your time.